Good evening. Welcome to the evening worship service here at the Bremen Church of Christ. Welcome all of our visitors and members alike. I invite you to grab a book or watch the screen above me and join in our song service this evening. It's my privilege to lead tonight. And our first song is number 38. 38. <clears throat> Down at the cross where my Savior died, down where the cleansing for sin I cried, there to my heart was the blood of mine. Glory to His name, glory to His name, glory. Hundred sixty one. Four hundred sixty one. <clears throat> After this song, we'll have our prayer. Four hundred and sixty one. <clears throat>
Would you bow with me, please? Almighty God, we're thankful unto thee for the blessings of the day. We're thankful that we can gather at the close of this day in your name and, and worship thee and song and be able to talk to thee in prayer to say unto you, you're the true and living God and besides thee, there's no one else. We're thankful for every blessing that comes from your bountiful hand. We have no way really of counting these blessings. Many times we take these things for granted and we pray that we may be aware of the blessings that come from thee. We're thankful at this time we can gather in your name and worship you and we pray that the things that we say and do will please thee and be in accordance to what thy holy and divine will. We ask thee, Heavenly Father, to be with us today to look down upon each one of us, forgive us of our sins, and help us be the kind of people that you would have us to be. We're thankful for the opportunity to meet here with this congregation, and we pray thy blessings to continue to be upon it. We're thankful for our elders and for our teachers, and we're thankful just to be part of this church. Heavenly Father, we bow in your presence, and we pray that we may give close attendance to the things that's being said. Brother Johnny brings us the lesson tonight. Uh, may the things that we need is the things he wants to say to us from your word. May we listen closely and, and pay close attention to the lesson and carry it with us in our daily lives. Help us to do unto others as we would have them do unto us. For those who are sick and afflicted, we ask uh, for their recovery. If it be thy good will, and we pray thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Be with us now as we further worship thee at this time. May our hearts be right in these matters. May we be drawn closer to thee, our God, and to one another. We pray these things in the name of Christ. Amen. I ask you to mark in your book number 88. Number 88 will be the song of encouragement after Johnny's lesson this evening. Looking forward to another good lesson from Brother John. Before he comes to speak to us, I'll invite you to turn to number 192. 192. I ask you to stand, please. There's a call come ringing on the restless wings in the lights in the light.
Good evening. My pleasure again to be with you this evening, and I am uh, hopeful, uh, as Chris said, to that we can have a good lesson this evening. He said uh, we're looking forward to another good lesson. Uh, take that as a compliment. And Melanie leaned over to me, and she said, that's sweet. He said that. And then she leaned over and said, don't disappoint us. <laughs> it's a true story. So I'll try not to. Um, as you see, this evening we're going to talk about qualifying for life's race, the key text being uh, Hebrews 12, verse 1, and another key text being 1 Corinthians 9, 24 to 27. And I wanted to talk about this because we recently finished uh, the Olympics, uh, and uh, they finished the Olympics, I should say, and, and, and we... Uh, our family uh, finished. We watched a lot of it. I enjoyed it very much. I love the Olympic competition. I'm constantly amazed uh, or never cease to be amazed by the, um, the abilities of humans when they put their mind to something and uh, what, what humans can accomplish. Uh, very interesting to me and inspirational. So I thought of uh, a lesson that we could sort of tie into that. A little, little late, but that's all right. Uh, we'll have the Summer Olympics again in another four years, uh, and then we, it will apply. But another thing uh, speaks to me is because I like to run. And um, I like to run uh, somewhat long distances very slowly, and I uh, enjoy that for the sake of uh, it's therapeutic and good uh, cardiovascular health. And then when Chad came here, uh, he and I were having a conversation at Brooks' wedding, and I learned uh, he said something about a treadmill. I had set up the treadmill. I said, "Oh, another runner." So uh, I uh, started talking to him about running, and then when the boys, Seth and Connor and Joshua, I hope that's the right name, uh, okay, started football this year, I said uh, to Chad that we can run during football practice, which is what I do because it's two hours long. Why not get some exercise? And so the first night we had planned to run together, and I want to put quotes around run together, um, and uh, Chad asked me, he said, you know, how, you know, how fast do you run? What's your, I said, well, you know, I run about a 10 minute mile, something like that. And he said, well, maybe I'll be able to run with you. I'm thinking, oh, okay, this guy's probably pretty slow. And uh, so then we got there, the first day he got rained out, and then we, then we got to practice on that Tuesday, and I went and found him, and it was about 90 degrees. He started saying, man, I had a big lunch. I'm going to have to walk some first before we run. And I'm going, okay, I'm, uh, I'm not going to have to have to wait around on him. So then finally we all got all situated after walking a few laps around the wreck there. And I said, now you set the pace, and you just let me know if you need to stop and walk. And he nodded his head like this because he already had his headphones on. And uh, I said, okay, let's go. And I reached over to start my little timer on my iPhone, and I looked up, and he was gone. And uh, I never caught up with him again. And um, he runs a little faster than I do, and that's okay. Uh, but uh, have enjoyed that and enjoy the uh, illustration that Paul uses in the Bible about running a race. He uses illustrations about athletic competition, and that's something that speaks to me and speaks to many of us because we enjoy a good contest. We understand uh, mano e mano and the, uh, the, 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 the thrill of human competition, athletic competition. You remember the old uh, wide world of sports uh, introduction so many years ago they used to play, the, uh, the, the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat. And we, we identify with those things. So this evening I want to spend a little bit of time talking about qualifying for life's race and thinking about uh, the application that Paul gives to us and how this compares to the life of a Christian. And the book of Hebrews, who I won't say is written by Paul, although I think he probably was the writer, says, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. We have this, this great verse in Hebrews 12 where the writer talks about in, in living your Christian life, remember that there's this great cloud of witnesses, these people who came before us. 
And the word therefore is there for something. And it refers back to Hebrews 11. We've talked about this before in all of that great group of people that we can look to for inspiration as we live our Christian lives and try to run this race. So it's, it's, it's about running, about staying in the race. And if you read on in, in uh, Hebrews 12, it says, um, Looking unto Jesus as the author and finisher of our faith, who for the glory that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. And we know, we know that verse, and that's such a great story, that Jesus himself endured great uh, tribulation and physical uh, 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 torture to, to accomplish his mission. And we should be inspired by that to accomplish uh, the walk that, and, or the race that God has uh, set before us. But all of those folks back in uh, Hebrews 11 become very important too. And then again, the other key text I mentioned, 1 Corinthians 9, I don't have this up on the screen, uh, verses 24 to 27, Paul says, do you, know, do you not know that those who run in a race all run? He says, everybody runs, but one receives the prize. Now this is referring back to the early, um, what we would refer to as uh, maybe the, the initial Olympic competition. In, in Greece and in some of the, the cities around that uh, that place in that day and time and they had these competitions and when they had a race they had one winner there wasn't a gold silver and bronze um, they had one winner and he received uh, a wreath or a crown And Paul says run in such a way um, that you may obtain it that prize and everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things so he says everyone who runs uh, has to maintain a certain amount of self-control to be in the proper condition to compete. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, that, that uh, wreath of leaves that we talked about, but we for an imperishable crown, that imperishable crown of eternal life. Therefore, I run thus, Paul says, not with uncertainty. Thus I fight, not as one who beats the air, but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should be disqualified. So how do we maintain our, how do we gain and maintain our qualification in life's race? And we want to think about that this evening. And uh, of course, as we do, we go back to Hebrews uh, 11 or 12, 1, that great cloud of witnesses. And we, we see that Abel is one of those witnesses. Abel, in Hebrews 11.4, says, By faith Abel offered God more uh, excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous. So Abel is a, a witness or, or an inspiration for us of uh, how to run properly. He, he did what God told him to do. We can, through the various scriptures in the Bible, reading the story in, in the book of Genesis, and then this uh, know that Abel, by faith, by knowledge of God, uh, was able to do the right kind of thing that God wanted him to do. He offered the right kind of sacrifice. And then we have Enoch, who bears witness to us uh, that, that God has this power to grant to us eternal life. And what a, what a wonderful story. Uh, Enoch, by faith, Enoch was taken away so that he did not see earth and was not found because God had taken him. For whatever reason... Uh, Enoch walked with God, and God just took him up. Enoch didn't die an earthly death. God just took him up and gave him, put him right there into eternal life. Noah bears witness that even when God's vengeance is called for, God will provide a way of salvation. We know, of course, the story of Noah. Perhaps the uh, numerically speaking, uh, we would say didn't save a lot of souls but Noah was a great success he, he saved seven and they were his family and he was able to do that and and not only that he preserved mankind because he was willing to do what God said we seen good old Noah built an ark and I always ask the pew packers how did Noah build that ark well he built it the way God told him to build it and in his obedience to God uh, he saved our race. So Noah is a great 
um, example and witness for us to draw strength from. And then Abraham bears witness that things will work out if we trust God and follow him. Abraham, who God told him to leave his father and leave his home and go to a place I'll show you, how much courage would it take to do that? Especially in that day and time, it wasn't like uh, you could stop at the rest stop. You know, you're going out into the wilderness and, and not knowing where you're headed and what's out there to meet you. Yet Abraham was willing to do that. And then Sarah, who went with him, bears witness that God keeps his promises. God keeps his promises. You think Sarah did a little bit of a double take when God told her that she was going to have a child? But God keeps his promises. And all of these people, this great cloud of witnesses are, are there for us. And it goes on and on if we read through chapter 11. And if we read through the whole Bible, we can even pick out more uh, that their God is our God. And that's inspirational. They were humans, just like we are, regular people who had a relationship with their God, and we are regular people who can have a relationship with our God, the God of yesterday, the God of today, and the God of tomorrow. So these should give us inspiration, but how about looking at qualifying for life's race? You know, one thing to think about when we want to stay qualified and gain and maintain that qualification is that we are running in view of the king. Did you know, a little bit of trivia here, uh, of course, the, the, it's not the longest distance race run anymore, but probably the most uh, well-known, the marathon distance, 26.2 miles, uh, was originally a uh, distance of 24.8 miles. In uh, 1896, the Olymp Olympic marathon, 24.8 miles, was based on the distance run according to a famous Greek legend you may have heard of, uh, of Pheidippides, a foot soldier who was sent from the plains of Marathon, where there was a battle raging, to Athens with the news of an astounding victory over the Persian army, the superior Persian army. Exhausted as he approached the leaders of the city of Athens, he staggered and gasped, rejoice, we conquer, and then collapsed. The marathon distance was later changed as a result of the 1908 Olympic Games in London. That year, King uh, Edward VII and Queen Alexandria wanted the marathon race to begin at Windsor Castle outside the city so that the royal family could view the start. The distance between the castle and the Olympic Stadium proved uh, to be the difference in the distance between the, the castle and Olympic Stadium proved to be 26 miles. Organizers added the extra yards to the finish around the track, 385 to be exact, 385 yards, so that the runners would finish in front of the king and queen's royal box. Every Olympic marathon since the 1908 Games has been a distance of 26 miles, 385 yards, or 26.2 miles, because they thought it was important for the runners to start in front of the castle and finish in front of the king. But we run in view of the king of kings. And in realizing that, we need to ask ourselves two questions when we're thinking about gaining or maintaining our qualification. Number one, is the race important? Is the race important? Is this Christian race, is being in the Christian race an important thing to begin with? And then secondly, if it is, am I willing to qualify for that? Am I willing to do what Hebrews 12 tells me that I must do. We haven't really visited this yet, but what does it say? It says, lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. So in the time we have uh, left this evening, let's think about what, 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 it, what are the weights, very quickly, what are the sins, and how do they uh, manifest themselves sometimes in our lives? And do we want to look like those people who are weighed down uh, and bearing that sin? Or do we want to look to those, these characters in the Bible that give us such great inspiration? What about the weights? What are the weights? And the weights uh, may not necessarily be bad in and of themselves. They can be something perfectly innocent and harmless in and of themselves. A winning runner doesn't always choose between the good and the bad, but sometimes between what is better and what is best. 
The problem may not be in what the weight is, but what the weight is doing, keeping you from running well. The bottom line is, if it weighs you down, diverts your attention, saps your energy, or dampens your enthusiasm, it needs to be set aside. And, and these things that have come up as examples of the weights can be our attitudes towards certain things. Uh, while they may be justified uh, maybe in the eyes of men, are they justified in the eyes of God? Are they attitudes that we can espouse and still be a Christian serving God? And then we have relationships. Sometimes we find ourselves engaged in relationships that are destructive to our service to God. And, of course, we always caution our young people, evil companionships corrupt, uh, corrupt good morals. Uh, we all need to take that to heart and understand that we should try to surround ourselves with people who are going to help us run the race, uh, help us finish the race. It reminds me of uh, uh, a time that I remember about how, how much encouragement uh, meant to me when I was running a race. I was Several years ago, I was running the, the Atlanta Half Marathon, which happens every year on Thanksgiving morning, and I had a goal. I had a goal in mind that I wanted to get to the finish line under a certain time, and uh, about nine miles in, I was struggling. I was fading fast. And I decided, uh, looking at my watch and doing the math, I said, I just, I'm not going to make it. I'm just trying to finish. And then all of a sudden, this, this group of people kind of surrounded me. And I noticed one of them was holding a flag. And the flag had the time on it that was my goal time. And this person was specifically there to help people who wanted to run with her get there in that time. And I said to myself, you know what, if I stay with this group, and I draw on their strength, and I can make it. So I, I sped up a little bit to try and keep up with them, and I started kept looking at my watch, and I said, it's not adding up. I'm not going to make it to the finish line. Um, and then I had figured out that I had started about two minutes in front of them, <laughs> so uh, I wasn't going to make it. So I, I decided I, you know, I'm going to have to leave them behind and go on. But for a time there, uh, running with that group gave me the strength and the encouragement to, to carry on. And uh, so we need relationships that will help us uh, to finish the race. And inc incidentally, just because I know somebody's going to ask me, I, I, I made my goal by one one-hundredth of a second. So uh, just got in under the, the uh, just, just barely made it. Um, what about occupations? Sometimes we occupy ourselves with things, uh, or maybe we even uh, have a job that keeps us from serving God. Uh, faithfully, or hobbies, or habits, or you fill in the blank here. What is it in your life that could be weighing you down? Again, it doesn't necessarily have to be something sinful in and of itself. Of course, all sins are weights, but all weights aren't necessarily sins. So we need to lay aside the weight and uh, let it help us uh, so that we can finish the race uh, more effectively. But what about those sins? The, there are some who are unwilling or unable even to enter the arena to begin to run the race because of these uh, sinful things these, uh, that, are, that are at work in their lives. Um, 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 and 10 says, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. And here we have a list neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. So again, this is a list offered up to us by Paul here. It is by no means exhaustive of those who are disqualified from finishing the race. Uh, but we do see here that uh, the unrighteous are some that would disqualify themselves from the competition or from, from running this race. Uh, and I want to step aside here just for a second and, and, and bring this out because it, it, it kind of jumped out to me when we were talking about this. Two points, really. Um, there are a lot of things in here, and we don't want to be named any of them. Um, and, of course, among them are some terms that have to do with homosexuality. And... Uh, it, with recent events uh, notwithstanding, 
Uh, this now is in our society considered hate speech because we agree, if we agree, with God's uh, inspired word here in 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 and 10. And as we know, recently uh, a well-known uh, restaurant chain uh, that we eat at, that Chris, Chris eats at about six times a week, and we eat at once or twice, uh, the president of that organization came out and said that he agreed that marriage is supposed to be between a man and a woman. No surprise to this audience, or, or none of us would disagree with that, but this backlash took place, and, and, and we're all very familiar with that, but there was another story I heard about that that, that really affected me. And it, it was the story of a man who took issue with Dan Cathy's stance. So he decided to take it out on a drive through window um, uh, a, a employee at a Chick-fil-A. And he, this guy was so brilliant that he videotaped his tirade to this young girl who had never offended him in any way, shape, or form in her life. And he verbally accosted her because of her boss's political and uh, religious stance. And she handed him his food and said, it's been my pleasure to serve you. Come back sometime. And she, <laughs> she shamed that man by treating him the way Jesus would have treated him. And I don't know if you saw that, but it really, it really affected me, and it, and it made me think, and I like to be optimistic, but this issue is going to continue in our society. And we're already being called um, that we're hateful uh, because we agree with God's word. And I'll say this and move on. That girl set the right example for us. Because the only way we can prove that we're not hateful is by not hating the sinner when we disagree with the sin. And that can be said of all sins, but of course this one uh, kind of jumped out when I was reading this. Uh, and the other point is we, we also ne need not uh, criticize someone else's lifestyle uh, if our own lifestyle in some other way is worthy of the same kind of criticism. We need to remove the, 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 the log from our eye before we want to remove a speck from someone else's. But that's just a side point here, free information, no extra charge. But that kind of uh, came out and I thought about that when I was reading this. But the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. They're disqualified from the race. And then we have heard these people who say, you know, I, I'm not going to be involved with those people because so many of them are hypocrites. I know some of the things that they've done in their lives. And uh, I don't remember who it was recently. You may have heard this point before. You can, you can be in, in the church building with some hypocrites or you can be in hell with all of them. Um, it's your choice. So... Uh, and that's kind of a harsh way to say it, but it's true. You're going to turn yourself away from God just because there are some people who claim to be Christians but don't live that way? How about entering the race and, 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 and doing it the right way? Um, and we'll move on through these. The, uh, how about the tailgaters? We're talking about the arena. Uh, this, kinda, this, this point kind of spoke to me. It's, it's just as good out here, folks. We don't have to go in and be involved in what's going on. We'll just stay outside and learn, you know, hear about it. Uh, and we know some folks like that. Uh, we also know uh, some folks who are the, I'm going to make up my own rules. Second Timothy 2.5 says, and if anyone competes in athletics, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. And then Romans 10, 3, verse 3, or Romans 10.3 says, for they, being ignorant of God's righteousness, seeking to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted to the righteousness of God. A lot of folks try to make up their own rules, and that they're not going to have the same uh, testing that the Olympic athletes have. One day I read an article about all of the Olympic athletes this year from all the different countries who were sent home for violating the rules. Many of them... Uh, for using substances that would enhance their performance that were illegal. Uh, but there was a group of uh, 
badminton uh, players who were losing on purpose to avoid playing the harder teams in the bracket. They would lose and then get into the loser's bracket and they knew that they thought they could play themselves up through that and they were sent home. They tried to make their own rules and they disqualified themselves from the race. We being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish our own would disqualify ourselves. We can't make up our own rules. And then there's the procrastinator, the I've got enough time to make it. Well, perhaps you'll have more time, perhaps you won't. No one knows. Continuing on with this same line of thought, what about the I'll sneak in without a ticket guy? Matthew 22, 11 to 13, the story of uh, the parable of the marriage feast or the, 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 the parable of the, king's, the marriage of the king's son. We remember the story there. God called the people, invited them to the marriage of the son, the marriage of the prince, and they didn't show up. The original ones that were chosen didn't show up. Uh, so he said, go out and find some more to come, and they did. But then in the end of the story, it says, the king came to see the guest. He saw a man there who did not have on a wedding garment. So he said to him, friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? And the man was speechless. The king said to his servants, bind him hand and foot, take him away and cast him into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. We don't get in except through Christ. That's the only way. That's the only way. And sometimes I struggle with the fact that there are so many people and so many different types of religions around the world, but I cannot help but come back to the book of John that says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to God except through me. That's the only way. You can't get in without a ticket. And then finally, the I'm afraid to wear the colors coward. John 12, verse 40, 42 says, Nevertheless, even among the rulers, many believed in him, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. In the book of John, John has already given seven major miracles that Jesus uh, performed, starting with the miracle at, uh, at Cana and turning the water to wine, and then uh, the, 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 the coup de grace, the, the, the epitome of these miracles. He raises Lazarus from the dead. And many of these people had seen these things firsthand, and they believed that he was who he said he was. But it says here, because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they be put out of the synagogue. It goes on to say they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. They were cowards. They were afraid of what might happen if they named the name of Christ. They were afraid to wear the colors. I also thought of a, um, a little bit of a uh, humorous... Uh, uh, illustration of this. Brian and Mark used to drag me along, not really, I, I like to go, they used to take me to the uh, North Carolina Georgia Tech game anytime it was in in town because Mark is a North Carolina fan and Brian, if you have not known, is a Georgia Tech fan and uh, so one morning I got up and put on my favorite shirt of that particular year, which Melanie would call my uniform. See, sometimes we guys get comfortable with a pair of shirt, a shirt or a pair of pants and we wear it often, and you think it's because we're lazy and don't want to pick something out, but it's actually because we want to make the laundry simple for you. But uh, anyway, I put on my favorite shirt, of the, which happened to be yellow, and I didn't even think about the fact that we were going to a Georgia Tech game. And so we got there, and it was Mark and Megan and their North Carolina blue, and then uh, Brian in, in head-to-toe um, Georgia Tech gold, and then me in my yellow shirt that sort of looked like a Georgia Tech color, and next to a bunch of Georgia Tech fans over here, and they started talking to me and all this. And at some point, Brian said, tell them who you really pull for. And I said, Georgia. And they all slid down the bench away from me. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, I, I was afraid to wear my red shirt to a Georgia Tech game. But uh, we can't be afraid to wear the colors of our king. Uh, we can't be afraid to wear the colors. We can't be afraid to, to uh, we can't be ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God to salvation. Or we will risk disqualifying ourselves from uh, the race. So how do we, how do we make it through when, when times get tough? How do we run when our legs are weary and uh, we're out of breath? Well, we can look again 
to these heroes of the Bible. Some of them have been mentioned as heroes of faith in, uh, in uh, Hebrews 11. Some that we'll mention have not. But very quickly as we conclude, we can, we can look to Moses, Exodus 3, verses 6 to 10. And this is when, when, when God came to Moses and spoke to him and said, you got to lead my people, you got to lead my people out of Egypt. And Moses, we know, made objection after objection, saying, I'm not, I'm not a good enough speaker. Uh, they won't listen to me. God said, you got to do it. You're chosen. And Moses gathered his strength and his resources, including God's help and his brother, and he went and he did what God wanted him to do. And then what about Gideon in Judges 6, 12 to 16, when God sent him out. The angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, The Lord is with you, mighty man of valor. Gideon said to him, Oh, my, my Lord, if the Lord is with, with us, why then has all this happened? And where is miracles that our fathers told us about, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. Then the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours, and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. A turning point here for God's people. And he says, have I not sent you? So he said to him, oh my Lord, how can I save Israel? Questioning himself. Indeed, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said to him, surely I will be with you, and you shall defeat the Midianites as one man. And we know the rest of the story that Gideon, with fewer people and supposedly a weaker army, was able to do that. Gain strength from these stories. And what about David when, as a young man, uh, still out in the fields tending the sheep, was anointed to be the king of Israel, to lead God's chosen people? Sometimes we, we, we get uh, concerned about putting too much pressure on our children, right? You've got to make good grades so you can have a good ACT or SAT score and get into college. And uh, imagine if your parents came and said, oh, by the way, you're going to be the king of the, all the people. Have fun. Uh, David was up to the task, wasn't he? He was able to do that. He, you think that was stressful for him at some point? Yes, he made mistakes. But David was up to the task. And then finally, uh, Elijah. Read 1 Kings 18 and 19, the great story of Mount Carmel and his conflict with, with uh, King Ahab and, and Jezebel and the prophets of Baal. And with God's help, he was able to stay the course. Qualifying for life's race, we need to look to God's Word and all that it has for us, especially these great heroes of faith and the inspirational stories of people who were able, uh, through their faith in God, to accomplish great things. This evening, I would ask all of us this evening, are we competing in the race to begin with? And if we are, are we staying the course? Are we looking unto Jesus as the author and finisher of our faith? Perhaps you started on that course at some point and, and, and lost strength and veered aside. Or perhaps this evening you've never named that beautiful name of Christ, never been buried with him in baptism, come in contact with the blood of Christ, and raised up to walk in newness of life. If, if we can help you with anything this evening, we are certainly here to do so. There's no better time than now. Please come as we stand and sing.
John, you did not disappoint, of course. Excellent lesson, too. And Brother Jimmy, this morning in our auditorium class and all others who had a public part in our worship, we're thankful for your efforts. For those that are visiting, we're glad to know that you are with us tonight. We invite you back at every opportunity you may have to be here with us. Remind you of those that we had on our prayer list this morning. Brother Hubert King is now out of the hospital. We're glad to report he's still got a long road of recovery ahead of him. And your prayers requested on his behalf, as well as Kenise Harper, who is still at Emory in intensive care, Jason Hickey, Tracy King is doing some better, and we're glad to report that. Janet Young Watson is now out of the hospital and back in the nursing home in Tennessee. Joyce Presley has some more uh, tests upcoming this week and does request our prayer. We're also glad to see uh, Sister Shirley and Brother Richard are back again with us tonight. Hooper Marr continues to await some, or he's got another test upcoming, we should say, this week. Cheryl Edwards' grandmother, Dorothy Caldwell, continues at the Southern Regional Hospital after suffering a heart attack. She is not doing well, and Cheryl requests our prayer. And as we mentioned this morning, Brother Noel Butler, former member here, former elder at the Villa Rica congregation, is at uh, the Kennestone Hospital in Cobb County in intensive care. Are there any others that we should mention? Brothers Keepers Group 1 meets this coming Saturday at Jacob and Julia's home. 5 o'clock sign-up list in the foyer. Fellowship meal after the evening service next Sunday evening for Stephen Higley. The area-wide singing West Georgia is Friday week, August the 31st, 7 p.m. The food truck from the children's home is scheduled to be here September the 10th. There are uh, paper bags with a listing of what they have need of. In the foyer, if you wish to participate in that, grab one of those bags and return it back to the collection box out front. A word about our gospel meeting. It is almost upon us. Three weeks, it'll be here August or September the 9th through the 13th. That's Sunday through Thursday. Um, there are flyers in the uh, foyer on the table if you wish to grab a few of those. We have set a goal Sunday of our friends and family day that Sunday of 300 folks. That should be a challenge to us, but we can accomplish that. We've done it before. As Jimmy was talking this morning, if you can actually write down <coughs> 10 people that you wish to invite and contact them three times between now and then, hopefully one or two of them will actually take you up on it, and we shouldn't have any trouble filling this building with 300 folks or more to heal Brother Phil Sanders. Many of you are well familiar with Brother Sanders. He does uh, In Search of the Lord's Way on Channel 57 in Atlanta every Sunday morning at 7.30 at local Atlanta TV. He is an excellent speaker and even better in person. If you've not had the opportunity to hear him, you've really got a treat in store. Lord's Supper is kept prepared for those who wish to observe it. Once we stand the scene, go through this door, second door on the left, and there will be someone there waiting to serve you. We're hopeful of seeing each of you at our next service. Brother Larry Acuff will be here and present uh, a lesson in our continuing summer series this coming Wednesday night at 7 p.m. Should we mention anything else? Our final song is number 344. 344. <clears throat> I guess I better turn to that and be ready, shouldn't I? All right, 344. If you'll stand, we'll sing and be dismissed. <clears throat> Step I take my Savior cruise before me.
Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the many blessings that you have given us. We thank you for the sunshine and for the rain. We thank you, God, for this period of time we've had to come and to worship you. We pray, God, that our worship was pleasing to you and according to your word. We pray, God, that you will help us to take the things that we have learned today and that you will help us to apply them to our lives so that we may let our light shine and let others see our good works and glorify you in heaven. I pray, God, that you will be with those of our number who are sick or who are having procedures and tests done. We pray that everything may work well for them. We also pray, God, that you will be with those of our number who are traveling or who will be traveling later this week. We pray for their safe return. We thank you, God, for the elders and for the deacons and our Bible school teachers and everyone who works behind the scenes here. We thank you for them, and we pray that you'll continue to bless them and the works that they're involved with. We pray, God, that you will be with our upcoming gospel meeting. We pray that you will help each one of us to do the things that we need to do to help others know about the, the gospel and bring them to you. I pray that you will be with us now as we leave here. We pray that you will help us all to have a safe trip until we return again. Please forgive us when we sin, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.